I should say before we get started, uh, what I'm going to do is I have some material to present on human mating strategies and human mating psychology. Uh, but I'd like this to be maximally interactive and get your thoughts or your questions that you have about human mating. And um, anything or everything, anything you ever wanted to know about human mating but were afraid to ask, but you don't have to be afraid in this room. Because you can ask me and I will do my best to answer. Uh, I brought in three copies of, of my latest book. Uh, this is uh, The Evolution of Desire, the, the new edition. Uh, and um, uh, these are going to go out to the three people who ask the three best questions during the talk. And Roxanne and I are going to both be the judges of those. I should say uh, that these are signed copies, which means that they are worth at least several thousand dollars a piece. So I don't want to see them on eBay. Uh, or you might want to wait a few years to be appreciated value. Okay, so um, human mating strategies, our, our psychology of human mating is extremely complex. And I think it, it, it may be among the most complex forms of psychology we have. And there's a very good reason for that from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, and I'm going to explain a little bit about what I mean by that. But uh, the way I want to start is that, um, just to note that, we are all evolutionary success stories. That is, every one of us, everyone in this room, has descended from a long and unbroken line of ancestors, each of whom succeeded in selecting a mate, attracting a mate, having sex with the mate, keeping that mate long enough for conception to occur, uh, and then typically holding on to that mate, mate retention tactics, long enough to see that child, you, survive. If at any point, if any one of our ancestors, your, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, all the way back through in this unbroken chain, if any one of them had failed in any of these tasks, you would not be here today, and I would not be here today. So in some sense, that's a remarkable feat that you go back thousands and thousands and thousands of generations of successful maters to reach this very improbable state of our existence here today. Uh, many in the past failed at these tasks. They failed to select a mate. They failed to attract a mate. They failed to engage in sexual conduct with the mate. They failed to hold on to a mate, uh, or you, if they did, they, uh, they let their child die for one reason or another. And so the, the history, the evolutionary history of humans is littered with uh, many more failures than successes. And so it's a rather astonishing feat that, an improbable feat that we are here today. Uh, so you can all, if your parents ever complain about you, can say, hey, I'm an evolutionary success story. <laughs> Stop your bitching. <laughs> okay, now I want to uh, just tell you a very little bit about the, um, the evolutionary framework and then plunge into basically four topics. I'm going to talk about uh, attraction, who we're attracted to. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, infidelity. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about jealousy as a co-evolved uh, defense against infidelity. So these are, these are the key topics that we're going to touch on, and, and then we're going to open things up for, uh, for questions. So you might be, want to think about your questions along the way. So most people, when they think about evolution, they think in cliches like uh, nature red in tooth and claw, or survival of the fittest, and the images that you get are organisms struggling for mere survival clawing at the dirt, combating hostile forces of nature. And of course, survival is very important. And, and it was so important to Charles Darwin that he even called his theory of natural selection, he called it the theory of survival selection. Uh, and he coined this phrase, the hostile forces of nature, which I think was a brilliant turn of phrase, to describe the things that impede survival 
Okay, and there are basically three classes of things that impede survival. Okay, one is the physical conditions of life. So uh, getting enough food, you don't get enough fuel for the machine, which Roxanne has graciously provided <coughs> some for us today. Uh, then you die. Uh, extremes of weather, you can freeze to death. Uh, or if you live in an extremely hot climate or you get stuck in the desert without water, then, uh, then you will die. You could drown in the ocean or in a lake, you will die. So phys the physical conditions of life, that's one class. Second class is predators. Okay, other species who basically want to have you for dinner. And, uh, and, and a third force is um, parasites. Well, actually, actually, these are, let me recast that. I want to put parasites and predators in the same class. So other species. So predators kind of get you from without. Parasites can get you from without. And in fact, as long-lived uh, organisms, we are hosts to thousands of parasites that basically set up shop in our bodies and use our bodies for their, for their fuel. The third important class of things that has to do with members of our own species, okay, who are dangerous to our health. Uh, namely, we kill each other. And it used to be believed <coughs> several decades ago that humans were the only species that killed members of their own species. And it turns out that is simply not correct. We know our uh, closest primate relative, the chimpanzee, with whom we share more than 98% of our DNA, <coughs> Uh, they engage in chimpicide. Uh, and in fact, Jane Goodall, when she first observed this, was horrified because it, it was widely believed in the field that chimps lived in peace and harmony with each other and peace and harmony with nature. And um, they don't. They kill, they kill other chimps. We kill other um, members of our own species some of the time. Fortunately, no one here has been victim yet of a homicide. Um, but the night is young, I guess. Uh, uh, if you are a member of a wolf species, 50% of all male world wolves die by being killed by other wolves. So uh, uh, co what's called conspecific killing, you're not killing members of your own species, it's very, very common. It varies, of course, not all species do it, uh, but humans have a long, long history of killing members of our own. If you go to the Yanomamo uh, in Brazil, 30% of all males die by being killed by other males, uh, typically in, in, in small group warfare contexts. Um, uh, other groups have uh, the, the highest reported uh, male death rate, and it's typically males, uh, is 40% uh, uh, among the Gabusi. And, and in, in modern societies, it's actually it's actually considerably less. Most of us won't. Most of us won't die by being killed. Um, in modern context, that you have about maybe uh, a one in two hundred chance of being of being killed. But if you're male, your chances go way up. Um, and uh, you know, and it's not that women never kill because they do sometimes. Sometimes they kill infants. Sometimes they kill in self-defense. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit of murder uh, toward the end of this uh, talk. Uh, but there is never once in the entire history, uh, in, in all of human recorded history, ever been a case of women forming a coalition, a war party, to attack groups of other women and kill the women and capture the men as husbands. Not once. <laughs> but there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of cases where men do precisely that. They form coalitions with other men, attack other groups, uh, kill the males, and capture the females. Now, um, I don't want to get too far, far into this, but we know now, based on the molecular genetic data, that, um, that this has occurred throughout human history. So, uh, in uh, genetic studies done in and around the former Mongolian Empire, uh, they've traced roughly um, 16 million males that have the genetic signature of Genghis Khan. Okay, and, and it's not alone. So you go to Ireland or Scotland, you see the same thing. You see these uh, genetic signatures where 
typically it's um, most females end up reproducing, but a much smaller number of males end up reproducing. And the reason is, in part, because they, males kill other males and um, try to monopolize the females. Okay, now, uh, so, so far I've been uh, kind of getting a little bit into mating, but, uh, but uh, Darwin was actually very troubled. And if I could see the next slide, uh, Darwin was troubled by phenomena that could not be explained by the so-called survival selection. So he noted the brilliant plumage of peacocks and asked how could this weird structure possibly have evolved. It's metabolically expensive and it's like a, it's like a neon sign to predators advertising fast food. Um, it's bad for survival. Uh, Darwin even said, and he wrote in his private journal, that the sight of a peacock gives me nightmares. He couldn't explain it on his theory of natural selection. He also noted uh, 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 sex differences, what's called sexual dimorphism, differences in the size, shape, morphology of males and females within the same species. So these, uh, these uh, people on top there, not people, baboons, these are homodryous <laughs> baboons. And in homodryous baboons, the males are about twice the size of females. Red fur seals, uh, off the coast of uh, Northern California, the males are about four times the size of females. So this sexual dimorphism um, is, uh, it varies tremendously across species. So in our species, among humans, males are about eight to 10% taller than, um, than females. But other aspects of dimorphism are more sharply dimorphic. So if you look at upper body strength, for example, Males and females in our species are extremely dimorphic. Lower body strength, not as dimorphic. Uh, and so we, we, fat distribution is another aspect of our, um, of our morphology that, that is um, uh, fairly sharply dimorphic. So but the, the reason Darwin was puzzled by this was this. Both sexes face the same survival problems. Both sexes have to eat. Both sexes have to deal with the hostile forces of nature. They have to fend off predators. They have to deal with parasites. Both sexes have faced most of the same survival problems. So why would the sexes differ? Shouldn't they look the same, have the same adaptations? Um, and so it was in response to these anomalies, like the peacock, plumage of birds, sexual dimorphism, that Darwin, that just simply could not be explained on his theory of survival selection, that caused him to come up uh, 12 years later with a second evolutionary theory, and that is the theory of sexual selection. Sexual selection deals not with the evolution of characteristics because of their survival advantage, but rather the evolution of characteristics because of their mating advantage. And mating advantage, there are basically two causal processes by which mating advantage uh, accrues. One is same-sex competition, uh, I'll mention, I'll go into a little bit of detail on these in a second. And the other is intersex selection. Inter means between, sex is selection. So this boils down to preferential mate choice. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the stereotypic image of uh, same-sex competition. And I'm sure many of you have seen this in um, nature documentaries, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, uh, any of these things. You see these uh, two stags locking horns in combat. The victor gains sexual access to the female. The loser ambles off with a broken antler, uh, very dejected, suffering low self-esteem, needing mate value uh, recuperative therapy. Uh, the logic is very simple, but it's very powerful. Whatever qualities are linked to success in these same-sex battles, those qualities get passed on in greater numbers, that is, they increase in frequency over time, simply by virtue of the sexual access that the victors gain. So, uh, and qualities associated with losing the battles basically bite the evolutionary dust. They fail to get passed on because the losers fail to mate. So now these qualities in, this is what animal biologists call contest competition, where there's literally a physical battle between in this case, uh, the males. Uh, but the logic is more general. So uh, in our species, for example, among humans, we compete with each other for position in status hierarchies. And position in status hierarchies gives you preferential uh, mating access. 
And so we don't have to engage in physical battles uh, for this causal process to work. Uh, so good social skills, um, effective tactics of hierarchy negotiation, these can be selected for, um, that is simply increase in frequency uh, if they lead to greater um, uh, mating access, these, these uh, competitions. So, um, okay, so that's, that's same-sex competition. Now, now, the reason I mention that it's more general is because it, 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 uh, when I, I've been teaching at UT for some time and at other universities, and I've never once walked across the UT campus, say in the, the mall, and noticed that there were two males engaged in a physical battle surrounded by females who were watching them and waiting to see who would win and then mating with the winner. <laughs> Has anyone ever seen that happen? Okay. <laughs> happens occasionally. Uh, so, um, but, but we compete. Now, it's probably the case that we did more of this sort of thing and we have competitions that are more symbolic. So we have athletic competitions, football, uh, wrestling, and most societies have some form of physical competition or athletic competition. Uh, but, um, but at any rate, let's move to the second component. So this has, uh, oh, oh, I didn't get back, I didn't get to the second component. So, uh, so I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, intersexual selection means basically preferential mate choice. And for preferential mate choice, again, um, this explains evolution. Okay, all evolution means is change over time. So what we're trying to explain is why do things change over time? What causes an increase in the frequency of some qualities, a decrease in the frequency of other qualities? Um, and, um, and here, so this, uh, the same-sex competition gives you preferential access to mates, but the other is what qualities do people want in a potential mate? And I teach a course, uh, not at the moment, I'm teaching a course on human sexuality. Is anyone in that course, by the way? A couple people in there. Okay, so, good. Um, but uh, most, most of you, and I teach a course, uh, uh, not this semester, in, in, in human mating, an entire course. So that's why I can't summarize everything important about our mating psychology in 50 minutes. But where I ask women to tell me what they want in a mate, because this has baffled men for many, many, uh, many, many, many. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so what I do is I start at one end of the board, and I just write them down. They say, well, I want to make who's, who's intelligent. I want to make who's uh, physically fit. I want to make who's kind, who's understanding, has a good sense of humor, uh, who's compassionate, uh, who has good verbal skills, who treats me well, who respects my friends, respects my parents, uh, who's healthy. And I just write them on the board, and I fill up five blackboards of qualities, and then, and then I run out of space. And so, so, so the reason it's complicated is one, there are so many things. The second is that there are, you have to have just the right amount. So they say, I, I want to make who's very kind, who's very altruistic, helps other people. So I say, so you want to you wanna marry someone uh, who at the end of every month gets his paycheck and, and gives it all to the homeless winos on the drag. They say, well, no, not that kind. Uh, <laughs> Just kind, just kind toward me. Uh, you know, so, um, so you have to have just the right amount of qualities, uh, and then different combinations of qualities, and then it varies according to context. I'm going to mention what one of those contexts are. That's a little bit more subtle. So, uh, so this is these are the locations, the 37 cultures that I studied, where I asked that question: What do people want, both men and women, in a long-term mate? Now, we don't always do long-term mating. Okay, one of the interesting things about our species is we have a whole menu of mating strategies. We have long-term committed mating, and you may think, well, that's so obvious, of course. People get married, they engage in steady relationships over time. But we also do other forms of mating. I'm sure you've heard of some of these. Uh, hooking up, <laughs> casual sex, one-night stands, brief affairs, you never heard of these things. <laughs> okay, so uh, we also uh, we also do infidelity. So we have one long-term mate, and then we sometimes cheat on that mate and have sex with someone who is not a long-term mate. 
And we also have cereal mating. And I don't mean like eating your Wheaties. Um, I mean that we engage in one mateship, sometimes break up, engage in another mateship for a while, break up, engage in another mateship. Um, and uh, it's what I call the Elizabeth Taylor syndrome, where there are different people in the male side. Um, Larry King, I think, is on his sixth wife. Uh, so, uh, so we have this menu of mate search, but in this study we were interested in what people want in a long-term mate. So, um, can I see the next slide, please? Uh, okay, and one thing that's important to note is that there are fundamental sex differences in our mating psychology. And a lot of these sex differences stem from fundamental facts of our reproductive biology. Okay, and it starts with the fact that eggs are expensive and sperm are cheap. Um, that is, uh, women are born with a finite number of eggs and, they, and they're never replenishable. And when women reach adulthood or reach puberty and they start ovulating, they, they basically ovulate one egg per cycle and until they basically run out of uh, eggs or the expiration date on the eggs occurs. So eggs have an expiration date, they are you know, just like eggs in your refrigerator, you can't just keep them say for 30 years, right? They go bad. Um, and uh, uh, sperm, though, are continually replenished. Uh, and so uh, I, I can't remember the exact number on the uh, uh, number of sperm that are ejaculated per ejaculate, but it's something like 9 million. And, but then they're constantly replenished. And, and do the quality of sperm decrease over, with age, yes, they do. So there is a decrease in motility of the sperm. There's decrease in sperm quality. There's a slight increase if the sperm fertilize an egg, slight increase in autism, slight increase in schizophrenia. Okay, but, but, it, but one of the sharp differences between the sexes is in how long they are fertile. So women basically have a very uh, steep decline in fertility with age so that by the time they hit age 40, 45, uh, fertility is extremely low and by 50 it's zero. Whereas men 40, 50, 60, 70, and even 80 can and sometimes do, uh, do reproduce. And so, so that's another sex difference in our, just in the facts of our reproductive biology. Uh, another is that fertilization occurs internally within women and not within men. This creates an adaptive problem that I'm going to mention uh, that's called the, the problem of paternity uncertainty. Okay, that is, women always know that they're the mothers of their children, right? No woman has ever given birth, and as the child is coming out of her body, who looks down and wonders, gee, is this, is this kid really mine? Uh, they know. It's 100% maternity certainty. Men can never be sure. Some cultures use the phrase, um, mama's baby, papa's maybe. Uh, capture that, that asymmetry. Uh, see the next slide. Okay, so uh, made attraction. So let's, uh, do we have um, clips? Okay, so we, we have a, a, a video here. There's only two kinds of people in the world. There's women, and there's men. Summer Finn was a woman. Height, average. Weight, average. Shoe size, slightly above average. For all intents and purposes, Summer Finn, just another girl. Except she wasn't. To wit, in 1998, Summer quoted a song by the Scottish band Bell and Sebastian in her high school yearbook. Color my life with the chaos of trouble. This spike in Michigan sales of their album, The Boy with the Arab Strap, continues to puzzle industry analysts. Summer's employment at the Daily Freeze during her sophomore year coincided with an inexplicable 212% increase in revenue. Every apartment Summer rented was offered at an average rate of 9.2% below market value. And her round-trip commute to work Average 18.4 double tanks per day. It was a rare quality, this summer effect. Rare and yet something every post-adolescent male has encountered at least once in their lives. For Tom Hansen to find it now in a city of 400,000 offices, 91,000 commercial buildings, and 3.8 million people, well, that could only be explained by one thing. Fate.
Smith. I love the Smiths. Sorry? I said I love the Smiths. You, you could just... I don't know if anyone's a, a business major, but in the business school they would call this job one uh, in the mating domain and from an evolutionary perspective. Job one is that you have to select a fertile mate. Now this is a problem because uh, fertility is not something that we can observe directly. So our closest primate relative to chimpanzees, the chimp males have it easy. They can identify fertility, right? The female chimp goes into estrus, you get the bright red genital swelling, olfactory cues, males go into a sexual frenzy, and then when, the, uh, when she day two messes, the uh, males basically become indifferent, they go, I'm gonna go look for some fibs now. Uh, now, so ovulation, fertility in chimps is not a problem, but we, it is a problem for us because we have what's called concealed ovulation or relatively cryptic ovulation. It turns out it's not totally cryptic, but it's relatively cryptic. So how do males do it? Next slide, please. So this is the logic of the uh, evolutionary hypothesis about standards of attractiveness. And the basic idea is that you have fertility on the one hand, and then you have observable cues. Full lips, clear skin, clear eyes, lustrous hair, good muscle tone, sprightly gait, etc. cetera. Uh, you have observable cues, and the theory is that our standards of attractiveness have evolved to embody cues that are statistically, probabilistically correlated with fertility. And so the issue is, well, what are those cues? And I've listed what some of those are. Uh, symmetrical features is one that's been observed. Some of you may have heard of things like waist to hip ratio, which is also a cue to fertility. Next slide, please. Um, it turns out, contrary to what I was taught when I was an undergraduate, I was taught that standards of attractiveness are entirely arbitrary that they vary infinitely from culture to culture and that they don't mean anything. So if you go to you know, uh, Nigeria or go to Brazil or go to Taiwan, that you will see everyone has different standards of attractiveness. There is some variability, but many of the standards of attractiveness, namely those that are correlated with health and, and fertility, those are, turn out to be universal. And so there's the, you can take photos uh, of any culture and then you bring them to another culture and there's agreement about which photos are attractive and which are not. Uh, next slide, please. So, and then, and then just about every month a new cue is being identified. So one is uh, uh, that my lab has discovered, this is uh, David Lewis was the pioneer uh, who spearheaded this, is lumbar curvature. It turns out, Males and females have different uh, a spinal curvature, and it has to do with the fact that women have faced a problem that men have never faced called pregnancy. When women get pregnant, their center of gravity shifts forward and puts torque on the spine. And that torque is, can both create damage but also interferes with the female mobility. And so it turns out females have, have a, 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 a curvier spine, it's lumbar curvature. And what David Lewis was able to do is to calculate the optimum level of biochemical efficiency that would produce the least torque, and then showed um, morphed photos that varied on the degree of lumbar curvature, and found that the most attractive corresponded with that optimal, um, optimal point. Uh, next slide, please. How many people have heard of a limbal ring? Well, you all have them. You all have limbal rings. You can actually use this as cocktail party conversation. <laughs> what are limbal rings? Limbal rings are these dark uh, areas uh, around the iris of the eye. And it turns out, this is a subtle cue, but advertisers could potentially use it, uh, limbal ring 
thickness and darkness changes with age. Namely, limbal rings get thinner and lighter with age. And so, uh, and so it turns out that in where you uh, uh, methodologically vary limbal ring darkness and, um, uh, and thickness, that people find more attractive exactly the same photos with the uh, darker and thicker limbal rings. And then the sclera is just the white of the eye. Uh, next slide, please. So, okay, to transition to the next top, the next topic, I want you to tell me who, which guy do you think is uh, the most attractive? Okay, just now raise your hands. How many think this guy is the most attractive? Raise your hands. Again, no takers. How about this gentleman here? Okay, get a few people. How about this guy? Okay, get a few more. How about this guy? Get some more. How about this guy? We'll get like a few. Okay. Well, it turns out that for women, it depends on whether they're ovulating or not. When women are ovulating, when they're in the, the fertile phase of their cycle, they show a preference shift toward the more masculine features. Okay, masculine faces, masculine bodies. So the classic uh, V shaped torso, a high shoulder to hip ratio, uh, and also masculine. Of vocal qualities, so I can't can't do it because I don't have this. But it's like uh, Samuel Jackson or or James Earl Jones. They have this uh, the deep resonant voice. And women like James Earl Jones that he he did this episode for Sesame Street where he just recited the alphabet. <laughs> a, B, and people, wow, that is amazing. <laughs> But when women are ovulating, they find that just more amazing. Uh, so, uh, okay, get to the next slide. So this actually gets into the issue of infidelity. Next slide, please. Okay, we have a clip. Okay, here's the clip.
just relax. You just know where I am, right? seconds and you elope with a younger man. Stephen, I, I, I'd like to introduce you to David Shaw. Pleasure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, both men and women mm -hmm. commit infidelity. We don't know what the exact rates are. Uh, Kinsey estimated them to be about 50% for men and about 26% for women. There's some evidence that the, uh, the that women are closing the gap uh, and reducing this um, sex difference in infidelity rates. Uh, it's, it, from an evolutionary perspective, it's fairly obvious why men would have a desire for sexual variety, uh, and namely because of that asymmetry in parental investment where women have to put in the nine months uh, men, basically, what's the minimum investment on men? <laughs> Two, minutes. Two minutes? Okay, well, there are individual differences. Uh, 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 but even if it's two hours, uh, then you can see that there's a large sex difference in minimum investment. And so what this means is that men can reproduce uh, by having sex with multiple fertile females. Women uh, generally can't. Uh, so women, if she had 10 sex partners in a year, 100 sex partners in a year, 1,000 sex partners in a year, she's still not going to increase her reproductive rate. And so it's been somewhat of a mystery uh, why women have uh, commit infidelity. So we could just show, the, show all the possible reasons, the, the, the leading <coughs> hypotheses that aren't shown. So I'll just have to tell you what they are. Uh, actually, yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, if her current mate is uh, low in fertility, or she can gain access to additional resources, or she can gain access to superior genes, uh, that is genes that are healthier, genes that will, um, that she can pass on to her children so that her children are more successful, survive more, reproduce more, uh, or mate switching. This is one of the latest things that my lab has been focusing on, what we call the mate switching hypothesis, where women who are um, in a relationship where they're sexually unhappy or they're emotionally unhappy, they're statistically more likely to have an affair. Uh, now you may say, boy, that seems pretty obvious. Unhappy women are more likely to have an affair. <laughs> and it is obvious, except the interesting thing is it's not true for men. So if you compare men, married men who have affairs with married men who don't have affairs, there's no difference in their marital happiness. So uh, men, so the, in studies that look at the reasons why people have affairs, men are more likely to cite sex, sexual variety. Um, I just wanted to see what it's like, or the opportunity presented itself. Women are more likely to say, I was, I was unhappy, um, the relationship was not you know, working out the way I thought it was, and so, and so they use affairs both as a means of uh, establishing, uh, testing the waters to see whether there might be someone better for them out there, or to trade up to a better partner, or to assess their own mate value, to see when, you, when you've been out of the mating marker for a while, you lose track of what your mate value is, your level of desirability, and so affairs are a way of dipping your toe in the, in the water, so to speak, to see, uh, to gauge whether you, there might be a better mate there out for you. Next slide, please. So jealousy, okay, the last topic that I'm gonna focus on, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, uh, from a, uh, a long-term mating perspective, whether you're a male or a female, it's bad if your partner cheats on you. You may say, well, of course it's bad. Now it's bad in somewhat different ways though. From a male perspective, it's bad, not that males think about this consciously, but it's, they jeopardize their paternity certainty, the issue that I mentioned before their partner is having sex with another man, then that means that this male could risk investing a couple of decades of his life and resources in the next door neighbor's child rather than his own. That's a very costly, costly in, in the currency of reproductive success. Um, and women don't have that problem, but if, if her mate is having sex with another woman, 
then she risks losing the man's um, investment, time, resources, uh, parenting, all of which could get rechanneled to a rival woman and her children. So it's bad for both sexes. So we expect that sexual jealousy has evolved as an adaptation to counter infidelity by partner. Next slide, please. Um, oh, and we have a brief clip here. This one is actually a, mm, not so brief. Not but so brief? This is the <laughs> and infidelity, so obviously I can, in the two minutes that are remaining, I can't go into detail on that. But just that, if you look at the psychology of jealousy, most psychologists have traditionally attributed it to a pathology, to immaturity, to neurosis, uh, to delusions, etc. Uh, but it turns out sexual jealousy, our psychology of jealousy, is very well sculpted 
very well designed to respond to real threats in the relationship. Threats of mate poachers, threats of a partner committing infidelity, uh, even things like mate value discrepancies, which although there's not an immediate threat, a mate value discrepancy statistically will predict that a partner is likely to cheat or leave the relationship. And so jealousy, the psychology of jealousy, has a very well sculpted uh, uh, set of design features. Uh, can we get a next slide? Yes. <laughs> No problem. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that uh, infidelities are cloaked in great secrecy, right? We don't we don't advertise it. Hey, I, you know, I'll go into a faculty meeting and say, Hey, guess what? Hey, I just had an affair last night. Uh, no, we don't we don't advertise our infidelities. We keep them secret. In fact, they've been driven underground. And as jealousy evolved to become more and more sensitive to ever increasingly subtle cues of infidelity, uh, these two things co-evolve. Infidelity's got more and more subtle, more and more secret, more and more hidden in response to jealousy becoming more and more powerful to counteract the infidelity. Next slide, please. Now, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, <laughs> jealousy is a leading cause of violence. Just because it's an adaptation, that is, it has evolved to solve a very specific set of problems, doesn't mean that it's a good thing. Okay, it in fact is the leading cause of spousal violence, spousal abuse, spousal uh, battering. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, and it even leads to homicide under certain cases. And, I, and I've done a, written a whole book on homicide, so and I'm just going to give you one slide from that, uh, and that has to do with Kate Moss. Uh, we had a sample size of 5,000 where we asked people, have you ever thought of killing someone? If so, tell us who you thought of killing, why, what triggered the thought, and describe what method you would use to kill the person in your thoughts. And it turns out most people, 84% of women, 91% of men said, well, yeah, actually I have thought of killing someone now that you mention it. Uh, and, uh, and then they describe in detail. Now, was Kate Moss in our study? No, Kate Moss was not in our study, but someone had a homicidal fantasy about Kate Moss. Next slide, please. My boyfriend is always telling me how gorgeous he thinks Kate Moss is. Really, she's just a skinny drug addict bitch. Remember, I thought about taking a wire coat hanger and putting it through her eye to make her brain dead. Then I would hang her skinny body up in my closet and show my boyfriend that she isn't so gorgeous after all. Make her brain dead. The, uh, anger that she feels toward uh, Kate Moss. Okay, now, if in our studies of homicidal fantasies, uh, homicidal ideation, we found, in fact, it all boils down to mating, almost all of it. Most people think about killing their rivals or mate poachers or potential mate poachers, uh, even if they're fictitious or in a dream world like Kate Moss, or killing their romantic partner and some other stuff. But mating and murder go hand in hand. Uh, so, and with that, um, I guess I'll just uh, uh, open things up for questions. Anything you want to know about mating, the questions you have, comments, anything? Yeah. Has there ever been a time when your studies have helped you outside your studies? Help me outside my studies? Just say say this. Um, I'm a very private person, so I'm not going to go into detail on on that. But I would say it's made me a lot more observant uh, about what's going on. So when I go to social gatherings or whatever, I see things that I didn't formerly see. Um, so just even little things like uh, it's seemingly innocuous thing: a man and woman go to a party, and then uh, the woman smiles at another guy across the room. Okay. This smile, it's a devastatingly effective tactic because on the one hand, we know that males over-perceive smiles as signs of sexual interest. And so then this guy starts going, oh, she wants me. <laughs> so he starts approaching her. Simultaneously, it evokes sexual jealousy on the part of her regular mate. But she just smiles. She's just being friendly. <laughs> so, uh, so you have this cue that is probabilistically related to 
different things, and it, it is basically manipulating male sexual psychology, to sexual psychology of two different men, just with one mere smile. So it's made me more observant about things like that, and I can tell what's going on more than I did before I launched into this area. Okay, yeah. Uh, how does this model of intra and intersexual competition apply to people of alternative sexualities? Like homosexuals or bisexual people? Yeah, well, as far as we know, I mean, there, have, there haven't been as many studies, um, but there have been some. And, uh, and, and what it looks like is basically the same sorts of sexual psychology uh, exist. So, um, so and, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but, but is there sexual jealousy, for example, uh, in uh, gay couples, in lesbian couples, in male homosexual couples? The answer is absolutely yes. And it gets triggered by the same sorts of things. Uh, and I have a whole, in, in the book, I have a, a, a large section that precisely on that, on homosexual orientation and how these different features of our mating psychology get played out. Uh, so, um, but that would, I, I could give you a 45 minute lecture on that, but I would just recommend uh, that section of the book. Yeah. Oh, um, have you noticed any changes in our mating strategy now that online pornography is pretty um, like worldwide? Yeah, online pornography. Yeah, the the two two major changes that have uh, influenced mating strategies in the modern environment are, are that online pornography uh, and then internet dating sites. Uh, so you have Tinder, you know, kind of in the there's a whole spectrum of, of internet dating sites from the hookup sites like Tinder through those oriented more term long term mating like uh, like eHarmony uh, or OkCupid, okay and then there are of course specialty sites. Uh, on, on the pornography, w w we don't know uh, exactly what the effect is. So there have been some hypotheses that, um, that it produces, uh, that it undermines uh, long-term mating relationships uh, because it gives, um, well, a as, as do internet dating sites, this is a hypothesis and it's not been demonstrated, but, um, but the notion that it gives people the impression that there are these, uh, an infinite number of very attractive potential mates out there for them. Uh, and, uh, and we know there have been experimental studies where with males, if you do have males repeatedly exposed to images of physically attractive women, it causes them to decrease their commitment to their regular partner. So there's some evidence that, that these things um, might be tampering with our evolved sexual psychology. Um, and the, 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 uh, the internet dating sites produce a, an interesting phenomenon uh, which is uh, it's, it's called the curse of choice. So like one of these, take it in a different context, we go to a, a grocery store, like go to Central Market or, or Whole Foods, and they, let's say they have a display of six uh, samples of jams. You know, and you try them, people try a couple, and then they buy the jam. If you put out 24, people go, they try a couple and they go, I, I, that's too many, I can't decide, and so they walk away and they don't buy anything. And a similar phenomenon might be happening with mating, that, that is we evolved in the context where small group living, where you would have only had available to you a limited pool of mates, maybe perhaps a couple dozen in your lifetime, whereas now we have potentially thousands or millions to choose from, and so it gives us this impression that uh, right around the corner there might be someone even better for me. And so it might undermine long-term committed mating relationships in that sense. But, but it's a great question because this, the study of these technological changes and how they, uh, how they interact with our evolved mating psychology is, is really, it's, it's, in an, it's in its infancy. But that's it's a great a, it's question. a great question. That is a great question. Well, so, <laughs> so, so you get, <clears throat> you get the first book. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so, if the meeting, would you do the feedback form for people? Just leave it on the table? So people can just leave it there? Yeah. Do you think that also, uh, in terms of monogamy, are we made for that? Or are we made more for just kind of mates? Uh, okay, so the question is are we made for monogamy uh, or, or not? Uh, and the answer is that uh, we have a menu of mating strategies. So, uh, so that's why I said early on we, have, we do have long-term mating, long-term committed mating, 
and it is true that some percentage of people do make long-term till death do them part, um, but we also do short-term mating, we also do infidelity, we also do serial mating, uh, which is a form of non-monogamy, right? it's just not at the same time. Uh, and so I would say in, in answer to that, you can't characterize human mating psychology as having one strategy. Okay? We have this menu of mating strategies. Which, which uh, items on the menu you choose depends on a wide variety of factors. It depends on your mate value. I mean, are you a, a, a nine, a seven, a five, or a, or a two? Um, if you're a nine, you're better able to implement your preferred mating strategy. Uh, it depends on things like the sex ratio in the population in the mating pool. So if there's a surplus of women, as there, as there is on UT, by the way, among undergraduates, in, at UT there's 54% uh, women and 46% men. Uh, and so when you see a sex ratio imbalance, then that changes the mating game because the rarer sex has higher mate value, and so they can implement their preferred mating strategy more successfully. And basically, depending on whether you get a surplus of women or a surplus of men, that shifts mating strategies, either more toward short-term hookup kind of mating strategies if there's a surplus of women, or more long-term if there's a surplus of men. So and when there's surplus of men, basically those men who are fortunate enough to attract a mate basically hold on for dear life. They, they ramp up their mate retention tactics. So, also, a good question, yeah. Um, how do you consider how social media may impact like, all of the jealousy and infidelity? Like, social media. Oh, that's an interesting thing. So, some uh, we have uh, in my lab, uh, one, of the, one of my graduate students is actually looking at, at precisely that, how mating issues get played out through social, uh, social media, uh, like on Facebook. And so, uh, so what she's looking at is things like um, uh, derogation of competitors, so uh, that occurs. Uh, people, uh, it, it enables mates to check up on their mates in certain ways, so wait a minute, did he, did he change his Facebook status? You know? uh, and, so, and so it's interesting, now, so the way I look at it is that we have, we have the, our evolved mating psychology, that's the only psychology we have, but we come to it uh, we come to these new forms of technology with that ancient mating psychology and, um, and so it gets played out in novel contexts. So people have always done mate guarding and vigilance of their partner, now they can just do it with the online media. Yeah? Um, would you say there are any outstanding consequences to relationships that start off with like, casual hookups? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Um, would you say that there are any outstanding consequences of relationships that start off as hookups or like one night stands? Yeah, well, um, statistically, um, if it starts out as, as a hookup, but, uh, let me rephrase that. I mean, one issue is um, having sex right away. Right. Having sex right away uh, affects male mating psychology in that statistically males are more likely to categorize the woman as a short-term mate rather than a long-term mate. Uh, and, so, uh, and so based on that I would predict that those relationships that start out purely sexual are less likely to end up in a long-term relationship or if they do less likely to last. Now there are lots of exceptions. I mean, that might be a generalization that I mean, I know lots of exceptions uh, to that, but um, but that's what we're dealing with. All these things we're dealing with sort of averages. Yeah. Uh, what are the most like bizarre, or outlandish sexual behaviors you encounter in human dating? That's a book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, the most outlandish sexual behaviors, uh, well, boy, uh, how long do you have? <laughs> um, I mean, there, there are those that are statistically uh, rare. So one of the topics that I'm studying right now is sexual morality. And so we look at um, why people 
uh, so what sexual acts do people judge to be immoral and, and why? And so we come up with things like, so you want outlandish? Uh, how about sex with dead bodies? Necrophilia? Is that outlandish enough for you? How about sex with farm animals? Um, <laughs> One of the interesting ones, and I don't know if this isn't terribly outlandish, le less outlandish is uh, sex with a, uh, a sibling, a genetic relative, a 0.50 genetic relative. So it's kind of interesting because uh, this is what psychologist John Haidt calls uh, moral dumbfounding. So what he does is, uh, I want you to imagine, uh, so here's, here's, here's the setup. So what he does is he says, uh, John and Mary are brother and sister, and they're, they're college students. And one summer they go to France for their summer vacation together, and they decide that it would be interesting if they tried having sex with each other. So, but they, they want to make sure she doesn't get pregnant, so she's on birth control and he uses a condom, and so they have sex, uh, and then they both agree that it was a, it was a very pleasant experience, um, but they decided they won't do it again and they'll just be there secret. But that kind of makes them feel closer to each other, psychologically. So you can stop the tape and say, is this wrong that John and Mary had sex? How many people think it's wrong? Wrong? That flew on? No. How many people were listening? So <laughs> most, most people say that it's wrong. Uh, uh, and then you ask people why, and they say, well, it's going to result in genetic mutant kids, and say, well, no, it's, there's the double birth control, that's statistically really unlikely, and they say, well, maybe they'll be psychologically traumatized for, for the rest of their life, and say, well, there's no evidence for that in the story. Finally, people just say, I don't know why it's wrong, it's just wrong. <laughs> okay, and so, and so what he argues, and I think it's a compelling argument, that we arrive at many of our moral judgments through these gut instincts, uh, gut, gut emotions, and then when forced to come up with some reason, we'll invent some reason, but that reason is not what really drove the moral judgment to begin with. Uh, so um, so there, there's that. So I don't know if that's, uh, that's probably not outlandish enough for you. I'll go, I'll go with the sex with dead bodies. Okay. okay. Last question. Okay, last question. So, okay, yeah. Um, how does the data on the ideal features of a mate affect perceived body images for young men and women? And how does that manifest itself in the way that people with less favorable traits pair up? And okay, I think that deserves a book. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. So <laughs> the issue is, uh, uh, how, do, how do these things, the first part of your question was how do they influence people's body image? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second is how does, how does it affect the way people pair up? With less favorable traits. With, which the people with less favorable traits, how, how do they pair up? So I'll do them in the reverse order. So basically there is, uh, um, uh, as a general rule, what's known as assortative mating, which is that people who are similar in overall mate value tend to get paired up. So the eights with the eights, the sixes with the six, the fours with the fours. So there's there's always, t if, assuming an equal sex ratio, there's a mate for everybody, um, unless some are monopolizing more than their fair share, which people try to do sometimes, both men and women. Um, but um, but it affects uh, it affects body image and in particular uh, female body image. Now to some extent males too. But there so if you look at the clinical literature, uh, there are uh, body image um, disorders uh, and eating disorders, and these uh, these are ten times more prevalent among women than among men. And part of the reason for that is that. Uh, men prioritize physical appearance and physical attractiveness more in their mate preferences than women do. It's not that women ignore that, they don't. Uh, but it's just even more important in men's mate preferences. And so women basically are in strong competition with each other to embody the qualities that men want. And, um, and, and, and when you have uh, that combined with mirrors, with um, Photoshop models and that we are bombarded every day with images of totally unrealistic people. So even they take the most attractive people and then put the, give them the most attractive s styling and clothes and hairdo and makeup and then Photoshop things. And so that's what we see. And so it's it's a weird um, modern novel input in that that skews our mating psychology. And I think is partly responsible for creating some of these 
eating disorders and, and dissatisfaction with, um, with body image? It's a great question. So, uh, well, thank you very much, and good luck in your mating.